I am joined today with Helen Patton, CISO, board member, and author of Navigating the Cybersecurity Career Path. Thanks for joining today, Helen. Thanks for having me here, Simone. I'm excited. Great. Well, Helen, we've had some great conversations in the past, and one of the things that I think we connected on immediately is our mutual belief that successful business outcomes are not possible without good people and a strategy to have good people. Mm -hmm. What in your own career path solidified this notion for you? Well, I think we've all had experiences where you, uh, you join an organization and you join to do a specific role. You're very excited about the job that you're excited, you know, that you're, you, you're joining for. And then you realize that you actually have to do this work in a community of people. And right. sometimes you luck out and the community of people think like you do and, and share your values and work the way that you want them to. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes you're part of a team that where your immediate team thinks like you do. And this happens in security a lot. We have this sort of little bubble of people and they all think the same way and everyone feels great, but we're completely alienated from the rest of the organization who cares about different things and prioritizes things differently. And so in my own career, I've experienced all of these kinds of variations on this theme. And I really got to the point of, of saying, if you're going to be a leader of security, you have to control that. Um, now, you can't control people, and I get that, but you can have very intentional strategies around what kinds of people do you want on your immediate team? How do you build relationships with people outside of your team? How do you partner with vendors or the broader security community to augment what you're doing internally within an organization? So all of those things have come about over time, um, and of course, I remember the lessons that were the difficult lessons most easily, unfortunately. Um, but I've also been really fortunate to network with people who've got really great ideas. And so I'm, I am all about liberally stealing somebody else's good idea and applying it if I can do that. <laughs> yeah. But also a good point. Sometimes you learn more by learning what not to do than what to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you, you actually wrote a book on this topic, mm. and it was released in late 2021, um, mm. just as we were all just kind of sitting at home, um, really learning a brave new world. But tell us a little bit about the book and what inspired you to write about it in the sure. first place. Well, so I had always thought that in my own career, I would either end up doing a PhD or I would end up writing a book. And I hit this point where I had a fork in the road, which one am I going to do? And I couldn't work out how to do a PhD and stay a full-time working adult. And so I decided to write the book. So that was that. And then the question was, what do you write a book about? Well, at the time, I was the CISO at The Ohio State University. And when you are there, you're always getting asked for career advice. You get asked for career advice from people, from the students who are trying to hack into cyber for the very first time. But I also would be asked to talk to people who were already in security, but they were dealing with some issue. How do I deal with being a woman in security? How do I deal with being just generically a minority if there's if that's not a contradiction in terms? Um, how do I how do I decide when I want to go from being a single contributor to a people manager? Like everyone throughout their career has these questions and I found myself being invited for coffee to talk about these things. And what I was finding was one, I didn't have enough tolerance for caffeine that I could meet with as many people as I wanted. <laughs> and two, the answers were mostly the same, right? Like you certainly, everyone's an individual, I get it. But from an advice perspective, you tend to start from the same point. So when I was thinking about what do I write, want to write a book about, I was thinking maybe if I wrote this down and my answers down, I could mentor at scale. And the, not that I, you know, my first response when someone says, can I buy you a cup of coffee because I've got a question, my first response isn't, buy my book. <laughs> uh, but it's been helpful for people who've gone, hey, I've bought your book uh, and I've read it. Now I have additional questions and that's actually been really valuable to me as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, one of the sections that has stood out most to me um, in our conversations as well, though, is the final section. You have it divided into three parts, mm -hmm. and there's a lot to, that's geared towards the individual, but there's also a whole section on leading and for mm -hmm. those who are starting to lead in cybersecurity. Yeah. And a lot of the elements that you discuss is 
what goes into building and communicating a strong business case for a security program. It, it includes things like having a security strategy and building a diverse team, how to fund that strategy, how do you talk security to a non-security audience. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually curious before we even get into kind of what should people do, what are some of the things you see today that security leaders make as mistakes that's standing in their way um, to preventing them from kind of having these principles widely adopted in their organizations? What are some of the pitfalls? Yeah, it's a, it's a, that question is like a whole thesis all on its own. <laughs> like it's very, it's, there's lots. Um, boy, I, I think the, the first thing I would say to answer that question is that security as a professional discipline tends to be everywhere in a business it tend you know it we we tend to sit in technology and we might originate from technology but we find ourselves working with legal or finance or hr or sales or development whatever we tend to be everywhere and the tendency of a cybersecurity leader who isn't as mature is to try and be all things to all people. And it's really easy in the security space to find a reason where you should be involved in everybody's business. And at some point you burn out. So being able to be clear on what kind of security person are you? Are you a more of a risk management kind of person? Are you a technologist who runs cybersecurity technology? Are you somewhere in the middle? Do you come from a privacy background? Like, understanding the kind of security person you are and then how that contributes towards the outcomes of the business you're trying to support. A lot of the burnout I see in leaders and single contributors too, but leaders of organizations is when what they care about and what the organization cares about does, is misaligned. That's where you really get burnout. And so being able to know yourself first is probably the first barrier you've got to knock down. I think the second thing is then knowing where your boundaries are, which I know is related, but um, there are some things you can control and there are some things you can't. And, and I think being intentional about what you can do about the things you can control, great, that goes into your strategy, that's where you spend your time. But being able to say, you know, this thing over here, this the way this leader thinks or the fact that I haven't got money right now or the, these things I can't control. So being able to then either be able to let that go gracefully or being able to then have a reactive strategy to that is, is really important as well. So those would be the first two places I would start. And I think often people who want that CISO title will go for the very first CISO job that they get offered. And they don't think about whether that job matches what they want. And they don't think about whether that organization could really value what they bring. And they, they just jump and they have a bad first experience. And um, I was fortunate I didn't have a bad first experience with my first CISO, but I did have a lot, I, have a, I had a long time to culturally adjust to that role. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, the, the old adage goes, you're only, you only are as successful as the people that are around you. And that That's includes right. the team you built underneath you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would imagine, you know, especially given the topic and, and you're very passionate on the subject, mm -hmm. what, when you talk to, um, folks you're mentoring or peers or colleagues, what are the things that you point to to articulate how important it is for them to take a people first approach to the organization mm -hmm. as a whole? Because again, as individual contributors, we have to make sure all those things are aligned. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have the right team, mm -hmm. it's going to actually contribute to that burnout. Yeah, for sure. This usually first comes up when people are thinking, do I stay an individual contributor or, or do I become a people manager? And when I see people's careers, there's really two big changes. If they decide to do the people manager route, and most people think they have to in order to get seniority, so they try it. <laughs> um, the first step is when you become a manager of people, when you become a manager of individual contributors, you learn really fast that to be good at that is a wholly different skill set than being a technical subject matter expert. And very few people train to be a people manager the way they've trained to be a software engineer or a security analyst or whatever. 
And so they're learning on the job. And they, if, they have, if they have any accountability, they realize that their failures as a manager has direct implications to the success and happiness of the people who are on their team. And some people go, yay, I love this responsibility, and they rise to the challenge. And other people go, hell no, I didn't sign up for this. I want to be an, an IC. And they go, and, they, and they're an IC. Good for them. Know thyself, right? If you don't want to be a people manager, yep. don't. But that's a really hard jump and transition to make. And I would argue that that position of being a manager of individual contributors is one of the hardest jobs to do because your senior managers want you to be a coach and a mentor and a develop and a people manager and all of the things that go along with it. And you've still got one foot in the technical swamp. So you've got to be both a technical IC and a manager in those roles. It's really hard to wear both hats at the same time. Yeah. The next big career jump is when you become a manager of managers. And I see people f- stumble there too. Whereas be- they, when they were a manager of individual contributors of ICs, they were able to directly influence these people. When you become a manager of managers, you've got a now you now have a layer between you and the ICs, and it's really easy to micromanage your managers <laughs> as they're trying to be people managers, and that's a whole different skill set to learn as well. So, um, you know, understanding what it takes in terms of coaching and mentoring, there's a lot of parenting overlap actually, that goes into people managers, right? You can't tell people what to do and have them do it and feel successful. You've got to encourage them to try and fail and test themselves. And it's not until they feel like they've been tested and succeeded that they feel competent. And you want them to feel competent. And that takes skill as a manager. uh, And it takes time. And often as a manager, you don't feel like you've got a lot of time. So it's a big balance. It's a challenge. I think the time thing is is so important because it's often the thing that we don't want to invest the most in because yeah. we would rather, in the industry, I've been in cybersecurity for a long time too, and we'd rather pay for a technology solution or, you know, create a new set of controls. And, you know, one of the things that always sticks out to me is that the majority in most organizations of operational spending is actually on People. people. It's on, on salaries. Yeah. Um, and so, and, you know, to your point, even about leadership and new CISOs understanding what is their goals, but how do they align to the business and what are those business objectives? Mm-hmm. What do you tell leaders to do at an organizational level or to help align their teams and their security teams to those business strategies and yeah. priorities? I think the one of the first things you have to do is actually not a people question. The One of the first things you have to do is understand how resources are provisioned in your organization. Um, you know, I've worked in finance and higher ed and now in technology, and every single vertical has a different way of managing money. And you're right, in every single situation, the cost of people is the biggest expense. But the rules around money can change. So... Um, for example, when I was in higher ed, if you got the funding to hire a person, it was very, very rare that that funding would get taken away. So it was sort of like permanent. If you got the money, you, you had the money for forever. You could count on it, right? And yeah. then as a leader, you could say, okay, I've got this pool of money and I can choose. Do I have one high paid senior resource? Do I have five lower paid junior resources? You get to make that Tetris game line up, right? In the technology sector, just because you've got money for people today doesn't mean you've got money for people tomorrow, right? And, um, you know, every company is different, but often you might get funding for a year, but not longer than a year. And so maybe you now make a strategic choice to say, I'm not going to hire a full-time person, but I'm going to do contract resources because of this or I'm going to invest in this particular software that's going to improve my productivity, but I'm going to plan to to not use that software after a year, after we've got other things in place. So, it's, so there is a people component to it, but you've got to start by understanding what are all the levers that you can pull. My preference, if I can do it, is to hire people to be full-time staff. I would rather have 
full-time staff than contract resources. But sometimes it's hard to find those skill sets and it depends on location too. Um, so, so, you know, so this balance between full-time staff and contract staff and you don't just buy staff, you've got to buy staff and be prepared to train them on the job. And you've got to be prepared to continuously train them because things change so fast. So your expense related to headcount is not just the salaries and benefits, it's also training and development and all of those things. And you've got to take that into account too. So, um, you know, if, if you're into jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, Lego Star Wars like I am, um, you know, the ability to sort of say this, these are the rules of the road and how does everything fit um, can really help you then say this is the kind of talent I need. This is the kind of seniority of talent. And do I have that already or do I need to go out and get that new? And, and that's part yeah. of an, an, an on, a new leader's role is to assess what's there. Doing some kind of SWOT analysis in the first, you know, 30 to 90 days is really important to help setting yeah. a strategy. Yeah. I mean, it's, what you're really describing is a, a cost optimization exercise because you might make decisions on hiring full-time staff, but maybe more junior, or maybe they don't have all yeah. the skills, but you're investing in the training. So that way you have a longer time horizon with them than one year money. So yeah. that jigsaw puzzle really kind of ultimately is, it's an economics problem. It is. And the, the one thing that's different though, I, I get sort of hung up on things like, efficiency like when you're interviewing for a job you're like I can run an efficient team and you can but if your goal is efficiency there is always an efficiency trade-off for security there is always an efficiency trade-off for diversity and inclusion right and so I am willing I am willing to say actually efficiency is not the outcome I'm going for it's an element but I am looking for an outcome that is the most secure and I get there by having the most dedicated people, the most trained people, the most diverse people. And by the way, that's going to cost you a premium to do it. But I'm going to add that personally is a philosophy of mine that I'm going to bring to the role. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's a great segue. The, the last question I have for you is once you apply all those principles or if you do mm -hmm. apply all those principles, how do you measure whether the things that you're putting in place or those strategies are having the impact on the business or they're successful the way that yeah. you want them to be? There is no magic metric. Um, I know there's mean time to detect and mean time to repair and, blah, 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 and, and there's all those things. But I think whether or not you're successful is very contextual to the organization you're in. So how does your, how does your organization measure success? Is it products put to market? Is it number of students graduated? Is it the number of deposits in a bank? You know, everyone's got a different business outcome they've got to measure. I think um, sometimes the measurement of success isn't a security metric. It can't, it should be, there's got to be something in that balanced scorecard that is a security metric. But it might be um, something like uh, the turnover rate of your employees? What's your voluntary turnover rate in your team? If it's super high, you're probably getting something wrong, right? Um, maybe if you're trying to do cultural change in the organization, you're going to measure the engagement of the non-security employees at your company with your security team. So you get into things like security champions programs or, you know, some kind of, um, security specialist kind of role that's not in the security team itself but is out in other parts of the organization so there isn't one one metric but for me internally within my own team i am looking for engagement metrics that measure engagement um, and for me some of the easiest ones to measure is how many conferences did my teams go to how much training did they take in the last 12 months um, how many of them have mentors of their own? How many of them are mentoring other people? Like there are really easy things like that that sort of measure engagement in the security program and in the team um, that you could start with. But you can 
you can spend your whole life trying to get the right metric and never find right. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just goes to prove that it's a, you know, a hard, a hard problem and one that yeah. can't be solved overnight. As you said, there's no magic wand. Yeah. Um, well, Helen, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And for those who are looking for an opportunity to read more on the topic, but Helen will still potentially get a cup of coffee with you. The <laughs> name of the book is Navigating the Cybersecurity Career Path by Helen Patton. Helen, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.